Today we're going to start moving into something that's probably a little bit more something you've actually thought of as being physics before. A lot of times when people think about physics, they think about how and why things move. And we're going to start off fairly simply looking at motion in one dimension and just looking at how we describe things moving, looking first at just position and displacement. So a couple terms to begin with that are important to know. One is that the first thing we're going to look at is kinematics. Kinematics is just the branch of mechanics. Mechanics is talking about movement and forces and things like that that looks at just how a body or a system of bodies moves without thinking about its mass and thinking about the forces that act on it. So we're just talking about describing the motion itself, not the causes of that motion, not really responses to that motion, just how do we describe that motion. To do that, there are two terms that we need. The first is the idea of a vector. A vector is any quantity with magnitude and direction. So if you're saying you're going five miles per hour north, that has magnitude, five miles per hour. So magnitude is sort of the numerical quantity. And then direction, which can be north, south, east, and west. We'll use positive and negative along x, y, and z axes a lot. It could also be up or down. So anything that has magnitude and direction is a vector. Anything that just has magnitude is a scalar. So temperature is a scalar. There isn't a direction associated with it being 30 degrees Celsius. It just is 30 degrees Celsius. It only has a magnitude. It only has that numerical quantity. So we're going to start off with position. And we're going to use a little bit of an analogy of a morning run as we talk about this. So conveniently, the house in our scenario is located on an x-axis. So we have the house, we have the origin, the zero point, and we have a positive direction here to the right. So we go from zero to positive five kilometers this way. There's our runner getting ready to go, starting the run at position one, which is zero kilometers. Runs out to four kilometers. So the first position is zero kilometers. The second position is four kilometers. Displacement is just the change in position. So position two minus position one, or in this case, four kilometers. Okay, if we then turn around at this point of four kilometers and run back, so x1 is four kilometers, x2 is zero kilometers, the displacement for that section of the run is now negative four kilometers. So in this case, we're just talking about motion in one dimension, motion along an x, y axis, well, an x axis in this case, and it's positive to the right, negative to the left. What if we look at the displacement from the very beginning of the run? So you start at zero kilometers, out to four kilometers and back quickly. So the final position is also zero kilometers. X2 minus X1 gives us a displacement of zero kilometers. So it does not matter the total distance traveled. Right? If I was saying how far I ran, I would say I ran eight kilometers, but my displacement is zero kilometers because displacement is just the difference between the final position, x2, and the initial position. Okay, so say on this day I was feeling pretty good and I decided to keep going. So I finished that segment of the run. There I am back at the house. And clearly, I'm feeling really good because I have my hands up in the air. And I decide I'm going to keep going the other direction. So I go out to negative three kilometers. What was my displacement for this section of the run? Now that we know a little bit about position and displacement, we want to talk about speed and velocity. 
When we think about speed, it's important to know speed is a scalar. Speed does not have a direction at all, whereas velocity does. In the same way, displacement is a vector. Velocity is a vector. So when we think about speed here, we say average speed is the total distance divided by the time. Average velocity is the displacement divided by the time. So I've gone ahead and kind of mapped out my little run here where I started from home, went out to four kilometers, back home, out to three kilometers, and then back home. So starting from home for that first leg, distance was four kilometers and displacement was four kilometers. So the total time was 1000 seconds. So my average speed in this case is also equal to my average velocity, which is four kilometers in 1000 seconds or four meters per second. Okay. What if I look from the start of the run to the very end of the run? Well, if I think about my total distance, I went four kilometers, turned around and ran back four kilometers, three kilometers, and then three more kilometers. So my total distance was four plus four equals eight plus three equals 11 plus three equals 14. So my total distance was 14 kilometers. What about my displacement? Well, there are two ways we can think about that. One, we could look at the fact that my position is zero at first and my position is zero at the end. So x2 minus x1 equals zero kilometers. We could also say I went positive four kilometers, then negative four kilometers. So if I add positive four plus negative four, I get zero. Then I went negative three kilometers plus positive three kilometers. So when I add that negative three kilometers plus positive three kilometers, I get zero again. So I do four plus negative four plus negative three plus positive three, I get zero kilometers. So my average speed is 14 kilometers divided by 3,500 seconds, whereas my average velocity is zero kilometers divided by 3,500 seconds. So in our first example, for the first leg of the run, my average speed and my average velocity were exactly the same. For this second leg of the run, they are actually very different. I will tell you, it's incredibly depressing to consider your average velocity if you go out for a run or a walk, because by the time you get back home, it's, it's always zero. And really, nobody wants to say they went zero meters per second. Now that we know what velocity is, with average velocity, we're gonna think about instantaneous velocity. When we talk about instantaneous measurements, we're just talking about measuring when we've made our interval of time as absolutely small as possible. So the velocity at any instant. So instead of looking as we go all the way from zero to four kilometers, we would look at a tiny fraction of time. One thing that I just want to make sure you guys get is again, velocity is a vector. So because we're just talking about one dimension now, we're just talking about moving along this X axis, it's always going to be either positive or negative. Velocity is positive when moving to the right and negative when moving to the left. The same way displacement is positive when moving to the right and negative when moving to the left. If you think about it, velocity is always going to have the same sign as the displacement because it's displacement divided by time, which is a scalar. So the direction is going to have to come from displacement. So if we think about instantaneous velocity for just that first half of the run from zero to four kilometers and back, the velocity is positive for the first half and negative for the second half. 
if you think about graphing something that's positive and then negative, to graph that, if it's continuous, it has to be zero somewhere as it goes from positive to negative. You can also think about sort of how this physically works. If you run and you go out to four kilometers and then turn around, no matter how fast you are at turning around, your velocity is going to become zero for some small amount of time there at four kilometers as you turn around. I don't care if you do like a super fast jump around or whatever, it has to be zero for some instant. This is a part of where instantaneous velocity can be important is that that's when we see that moment where velocity is zero. We can watch our same run again in slightly slower motion. See the positive velocity for the first half and probably mostly constant velocity for most of that first half, sort of once you got warmed up and moving, and then mostly constant velocity for the second half with zero in between. If we look at our graph of position versus time, we now have an equation for instantaneous velocity. We say that velocity is the limit as delta t approaches zero. So the limit as we make our interval of time as small as we possibly can of the change in position over the change in time. Remember that change in position is just displacement. So that'd be x2 minus x1 over the change in time, the time when you were at position x1 and the time in position that you were in position x2. It's the difference between those two. So time at position two minus time at position one. And that's how we figure out instantaneous velocity. For those that are somewhat calculus savvy or calculus friendly, you could think of it as the derivative of position versus time. If you're totally uncalculus savvy or calculus friendly, just ignore that. If we think about that, if you remember back to learning limits, a lot of times when we look at this limit as the x-axis approaches zero of some function plotted on the y-axis, we're really thinking about a tangent. So if we look right here, at this point in time, my instantaneous velocity would be the slope of this line that's tangent to my position, my plot of position versus time. And you can see that through most of this part of the graph, it would be fairly consistent. Um, there's a fairly consistent slope through here. It changes a little bit, but it's fairly consistent and positive through this part of the graph it's fairly consistent and negative all the way through here. So the velocity would be negative from the time I turn around at four kilometers till the time I turn around again at negative three kilometers. And then it would be positive here from negative three up to zero. Here, right where I turn around is where we see that I have that zero instantaneous velocity for just a section, second or a fraction of a second. And the tangent to the line right there would be zero. So the instantaneous velocity at that point is zero. The last term we need in kinematics is acceleration. So acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time. This is an idea that sometimes confuses students because we don't really talk about acceleration and deceleration in physics. Everything that is a rate of change in velocity is an acceleration, whether speeding up or slowing down. So yes, when you accelerate in your car, that's in physical terms an acceleration. But when you put the brakes on and slow down, in physics, that's also acceleration because in both of those cases, your velocity is changing. In a straight line, your velocity is changing because the magnitude of velocity is changing. If you turn, the direction changes, and that's also a change in velocity and is also an acceleration. So we can find average acceleration as the sort of final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by the change in time, so delta v over delta t. And just like we did with velocity, if we make acceleration as small as possible, sorry, if we make the change in time 
as small as possible, we can get instantaneous acceleration, which is the limit as our delta t approaches zero of the change in velocity over the change in time. Or again, if you're calculus savvy, it's the derivative of velocity with respect to time.